All right, it looks like um, people joining, the wave of joining is slowing down a little bit, so um, I'll start. So this is our virtual replacement for TFRG meeting in Vancouver. I'm Alexey Melnikov and uh, Nick and Stanislav are my co-chairs and I don't see slides anymore. They must be projected. Just give me a moment again. Good. Um, so um, you, you might have noticed we have a new co-chair. So Kenny Patterson stepped down and we have Stanislav who was promoted from the crypto panel. Next slide, please. So um, this is the first virtual session that we ever done as far as I remember. This session is being recorded. We have minutes being taken in other part. We have Jabber for side channel discussions as well as asking, joining the queue. So please send um, Q plus and Q minus to Jabber if you want to, to be added to the queue um, after each document. A few people are already in the back, so, and uh, you have a link for other part. Next slide. So um, we're a part of IRTF. We are governed by general IRTF and IETF IP rules. I hope you, you've read all of this. Next slide. Usual comments, you know, be, be nice to each other policy. Um, next slide. And next slide. Right. So um, we have, we should have all um, presentations uploaded. I will speak quickly about document status and what has happened since the Singapore ITF meeting. Um, yes, uh, typically we do bash agenda, but I assume, sorry, I sort of haven't thought of including the agenda in the slides. Um, right, document status. We have no new RFCs in Singapore, no documents in RFC editors queue. Um, we have a couple of documents in IRSG review. Argon2 is waiting for revision um, from authors. Um, there were some minor comments raised during IRSG review. And randomness improvements just um, went to IRSG and waiting for the, for the initial IRSG review. Um, we do have one document which Kenny was responsible for. I think we need to find a new shepherd for this one. And we also have quite a lot of uh, documents um, in flight. Pretty much everyone was updated. Um, of particular interest. Group 12 went to research group last call. There were some comments raised. Um, I am the document shepherd. I need to uh, follow up on this um, and see what's the next step is going to be. Um, if people have any comments, on on the current documents send them send comments in jabber or please pick up now i can give you a couple of minutes i 
Um, let's move on. So, crypto review panel. Um, we had it was established three years ago. It was running for three years. We extended the term for um, initial term was two years. We extended it for one year. Um, and and the end of December we we solicited. Uh, names of volunteers and we selected a new panel so we have and my apologies i probably will butcher somebody's first names um so my my apologies my double apologies so we have scott ross yaren and bjorn are continuing we have new members chloe uh julia um, Karthekian, uh, Thomas, Jean, Jean Philippe, and John. And thank you for our former uh, former members, Stanislav, Tibor, and Pierre Alon. For, for contributing to the crypto panel in the past. Um, chairs are relying quite a lot on crypto panel. Um, this is both used for reviews of documents in CFRG itself, as well as requests from security area and requests from dependent streams. Yeah, thank you. So um, the other major uh, part uh, that happens in Singapore, we started pack selection process last year. We finished phase one for Singapore and we didn't quite pick uh, one candidate in each category so we needed to do phase two and Stanislav is going to present about it right away and I think that's it from chairs update um, for Q management uh, we're gonna actually stick to the WebEx for um, plus Q to enter the queue and minus queue to, to exit the queue. And I'll be managing this just, just so that we don't have to switch between Jabber and Cisco. Agree, a lot agree. All right, um, Stanislav, you're going next. Uh, hello, everybody. One more reminder to uh, sign your names in virtual blue sheets. Uh, the links to the blue sheets were in the chat. I think that uh, they're easy to be found. Uh, so, uh, my slides are about results of our pack selection process uh, on behalf of CFRG chairs. So, uh, a little history. Uh, all of this started at ITF 103. After receiving a lot of uh, PEC proposals, uh, we decided to announce the PEC selection process uh, involving Crypto Review Panel to do all reviews. So, we had four balanced PECs nominated and four augmented PECs nominated. They are on, on the slides. Uh, in Singapore, we finalized round one of the PEC selection process and we announced that we selected four candidates, uh, two balanced and two augmented, based on all of great reviews done by our volunteers and by Crypto Review Panel members. Uh, also, uh, since there was a lot of desire in reviews to have both balanced and augmented pack, uh, we uh, decided that uh, we had a reasonable amount of desire to have both a balanced pack and an augmented pack. Uh, so the main intention of new round was to select uh, one of zero balanced pack and one of zero augmented pack. Uh, the timeline is on the slide. It was announced in the mailing list. Uh, first of all, we uh, had a request uh, for additional questions for all candidates. Then we publish those, these, those questions, then we ask CFRG if anything else should be added. Uh, and then uh, the authors of the candidates uh, prepared their replies. Uh, after that, we had 
one month of crypto review uh, panel members doing their reviews, doing their job, and uh, we had uh, great reviews. Uh, after that, uh, I would say before Vancouver, but before 21st of March, uh, we discussed the reviews and then make made recommendations uh, and uh, wanted to uh, select at least uh, zero or one balance pack and one or zero augmented pack. So the results of stages. Uh, we had a lot of great questions. Uh, they could be of one of possible types. It was uh, in the mailing list. And we had these uh, five questions. First of all, two clarifications about possible modifications of SPEC2 and CPACE and LCPACE. Uh, the third question was uh, about IPR issues, uh, specifically on some issues about SPEC2 and OPEC. And uh, two more questions uh, for all protocols about quantum annoyance and about post quantum preparedness. The definitions of these terms were in the mailing list. Uh, during stage three, three we um, asked all authors to uh, prepare their replies, and uh, all of those replies uh, are published at GitHub, as a link is at the slide. Uh, we had stage four, uh, where uh, four uh, crypto panel members. Uh, namely, Bjorn Teichmann, Russ Hausley, Julia Hess, and Scott Sturer prepared their reviews. Uh, uh, all four reviews were really great, and uh, the involvement of uh, Crypt Review Panel members was really uh, extremely important for the process. All reviews are available at the GitHub, and uh, if to be short, uh, these are uh, for short versions of these reviews. So the recommendations are highlighted in blue for balanced spec and in uh, magenta for uh, augmented pack. So for augmented pack, all four reviewers uh, recommended OPEC, and for balanced pack, three or four recommended CPACE. Uh, so the results now the pack selection process is finished. Uh, we had a discussion with Nick and Alexei, and uh, the uh, opinion is uh, one for uh, all, of, all three of us. We recommend uh, three, uh, we're going to, um, for, uh, from uh, four protocols uh, to select one balanced pack and one augmented pack, CPACE for one balanced pack, and um, uh, uh, OPEC for an augmented pack. Uh, so, the process is finished, uh, the results are published at GitHub and in the mailing list, and so now we are thinking about what to do next. Before that, uh, we would like to thank all persons that were involved in the process, to all authors of the nominations, to Watson Light, Benjamin Kadik, Van Hau, Dan Harkins, Bjorn Haas, uh, Hugh Kravchuk, Gullin Van, and Steve Thomas. Uh, it was a very great contest because all uh, eight candidates were really strong. We would like to thank all the reviewers at stage one because uh, those independent reviews um, helped us to understand uh, all particular issues about uh, each protocols regarding a lot of uh, different uh, things, including security, including performance, etc. And of course, we'd like to thank all Crypt Review man panel members uh, who were involved uh, in stage uh, uh, four of the round two and in round one. Uh, so, special thanks to all of them. What now? Uh, now, initiate a CFRG document on recommendations for PACs in IDF protocols. Uh, it was uh, decisions that we uh, tried to discuss in Singapore and discussed beforehand. Uh, so uh, we had a lot of um, desire from our reviewers what should be involved and what should be included in this document. First of all, a detailed description of the pack or packs uh, recommendations for parameters, uh, auxiliary primitives, test vectors and guidelines. Because as we understand, uh, PEC is one of the kind of uh, protocols that can be very easily uh, implemented strongly. So uh, guidelines are really crucial here. 
For example, if uh, cross cipher suit security is not taken into account, the pack can be easily broken. It's it's very easy to uh, show some examples, and uh, some other issues are on the slide. And now uh, we had a discussion with Nick and Alexei, and uh, we have uh, two questions. First of all, do we need one or two documents? So option one is to prepare one document on recommendations for PEC uh, in uh, ITF protocols with both CPAs and OPEC. And option two, to prepare two documents, one for balanced PEC and one for augmented PEC. Uh, we'd like to say that we'll, uh, we will have the final say in case of absence of strong arguments. But of course, we are really uh, hoping that a lot of strong arguments will appear in the list. So please uh, say something in the list. Uh, we have a lot of lots of pros and cons uh, for each of options, and we think that uh, it must be decided in the list. And uh, the second question is about editors and authors of the document. So if if you have any volunteers, please send a message to the chairs. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, think about who will be the editors and authors. Uh, that's all. Please, questions, comments, considerations. Okay, so there's one person in the queue, Russ Housley. Hi, I'd just like to recommend option two. I think it makes it much more clear who the author should be and gives credit for the inventors. Uh, thank you, Russ. Uh, personally, personally, I agree with option two because uh, balanced and augmented uh, packs uh, are really two kinds of protocols for different uh, use cases, but uh, I think that a lot of people can have some pros for option two, so option one, but thank you for the opinion. All right. Um, one more entry to the queue. Thank you. I would like to say that if we choose option two, it is necessary from my point of view to include some paragraph or couple of paragraphs in each document referring to our document just in case that uh, the developer uh, should can or should choose between two of these options being maybe not very well acquainted with both thank you and uh, another thing for as a point of order we can use uh, option uh, raising hand in webex it works very well and it should even keep the queue in fee for stage so about the box <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree that uh, such commands can be useful in both documents. I think that uh, after some discussion in email and after we understand who will be the editor and who will be uh, the authors, uh, we will try our best to uh, organize a discussion about which points should be addressed in the documents. Thank you. Uh, Jov. So, do we intend these documents to specify the uh, protocols or do we intend them to be just recommendations? Uh, there's a document uh, describing the protocol and use this one. Uh, in my understanding, in my personal understanding, um, we have selected uh, two protocols and we must pre prepare uh, the most detailed uh, descriptions of them as, as possible. A lot of people in the mailing list and in personal communications uh, uh, told us that uh, it is critical that in the documents that are describing the packs, uh, a lot of very specific recommendations for implementations must be made. So, in my opinion, uh, these documents should describe uh, the protocols uh, together with recommendations of how to implement this. So, uh, since CPACE and OPEC are not presented in existing RFCs, I think that it, was, it would be a problem to just define these protocols in these uh, two documents or one document. So, in, in, well, yes. in that case, I agree that it has to be two documents. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, your own, Sheffer. Sorry, another motivation uh, for separate documents is uh, I uh, to to make it clear which concerns apply to uh, to which document. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have a lot of uh, arguments and uh, pros for option two. I think. Uh, Daniel, you go. Yes. So. Um... Yeah, I have. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of echoing uh, Yaren's concerns. Um, I like the fact to have two documents, but also like not to repeat the pro and cons in each of those documents. So um, I'm wondering if uh, three documents should not be required at that point. Okay, thanks for his opinion. I believe that we'll continue the discussion in the mailing list, but of course, uh, we'll try to uh, maybe to have a citation of all uh, considerations uh, and concerns that has been said now, uh, and we'll take them from the notes of the meeting, and maybe we'll send them to the list to start the discussion. Okay, and maybe before doing that, uh... If anybody in either Jabber or WebEx has a strong preference for option one, um, please uh, step to the queue. Thanks. I think that's clear. Okay. Uh, any more questions, comments, considerations? Uh, then thank you very much. And uh, our next slides uh, is slides from Oleg Taraskin. Uh, Oleg, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Please, start, uh, please tell me next slide after each slide. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Oleg Taraskin. I'm a chief cryptography engineer at Waves uh, Platform. I'm going to tell you about uh, first isogeny based post quantum PAIC uh, protocol. My joint work with my colleagues, Dr. David Jao, Dr. Vladimir Sukharev, and Jason Legro. Uh, next, please. Uh, the need in uh, quantum safe replacement for exi existing uh, PAIX protocol uh, arises from the fact that security of all industry PAICs are based on elliptic uh, curve discrete logarithm problem or discrete logarithm problem or factoring. Uh, all these uh, problems are really hard, but uh, only for attacker who uh, doesn't have large enough uh, quantum computer. Uh, next, please. For example, if we want to break ECDLP for any of popular curves, uh, we need a quantum computer with uh, one and a half thousand qubits and uh, use algorithm of sure to solve a CDLP in polynomial time. The biggest number is entang of entangled qubits obtained at the moment is around 100, and uh, we have already reached uh, quantum supremacy. Obvious way to solve the problem is to build protocols based on another hard problems that are quantum safe. Uh, one of solutions is to use isogenies. Uh, next slide. What are isogenies? Isogenies are a special case of homomorphism between elliptic uh, curve groups. If we have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, an isogeny between them is non-constant algebraic morphism that have following form. F1, F2, G1, G2 are polynomials in X and Y. It also maps points at infinity to point at infinity. And, uh, isogeny degree is the maximum degree of polynomials F1 and F2. If isogeny from E1 to E2 exists, uh, when isogeny from E2 to E1 also exists, and both uh, curves are isogenous. Uh, next, please. Here is an example how an isogeny can look like. Uh, let's consider two curves of the same finite field, and both curves have the same number of points. One of the possible isogenies uh, for this uh, sample has degree three. As you can see, three is the maximum degree of polynomials F1 and F2. 
Let's pick up some random points A and B on E1 and, uh, and calculate where sum C. Easy to see that isogeny preserves group law. Image of A plus image of B is equal to image of C. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> How to construct isogeny? Isogeny is a group homomorphism that is defined by its kernel, the group of points that are mapped to the point at infinity. Uh, order of the kernel group is equal to isogeny degree. So if we have uh, some curve, we can select one of its subgroups of points and calculate isogeny curve. There is an algorithm of value that takes on input uh, the curve and its uh, subgroup and outputs uh, isogenous curve uh, and formula for point mapping. Uh, next, please. Another way how to denote, denote uh, curve isogenous uh, to curve E is to use generator of kernel group. Uh, here you can see uh, generator JK. Uh, Theorem of state states that two curves of the same finite field are isogenous if and only if we have the same number of points. Uh, next. In our previous example, isogeny of degree three was calculated by choosing kernel group K of order three and uh, applying uh, values algorithm. Uh, next, please. Uh, we have two elliptic curves of a finite field and both have the same order. Uh, the hard problem is to find isogeny between them. Uh, the problem is easy to solve when uh, even on classical computer, if both curves are isomorphic uh, when we have equal gene variants. That's why we will consider only interesting from cryptographic point of view isogenies between different classes of uh, isomor uh, isomorphisms. Uh, classes have different J invariants. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we need uh, just uh, one more definition uh, to talk about Diffie-Hellman kick change on isogenies. And torsion points is a set of points such that where multiplication with uh, n gives a point, a point at infinity. So uh, order of uh, that point is n or divides n. Uh, set of n torsion points in is n torsion subgroup. It has order equal to n squared and two-dimensional structure. It's each point of uh, subgroup uh, can be expressed using two base points, uh, e and q in the following form, as you can see. Uh, next, please. Uh, super singular, uh, one more definition. Uh, super singular curve, it's a curve with a number of points, uh, minus one is divisible on characteristic uh, of uh, its field. It uh, has very interesting properties from uh, post-quantum cryptography point of view. Uh, that's why we use exactly super singular curve, uh, curves uh, that is uh, impossible to use uh, in uh, for, for classical cases, for uh, classical elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, that's all with math. Uh, get down to business. Um, so now we have all uh, to describe uh, SIDH, uh, super singular isogeny, uh, isogeny key exchange. It was uh, proposed by David Jiao and uh, Luca Adafeo about 10 years ago, and since, since when uh, was subject of research for cryptographic community. Super singular isogeny key encapsulation protocol, PSYCHE, uh, uh, uses the same base math as SIDH and now is uh, the sec in, in the second round on this post-quantum post standardization process. Uh, we pick the super singular curve, curve uh, over quadratic extension of uh, prime field with uh, prime p uh, of the uh, following form and fix base point uh, for two uh, torsion groups. 
Uh, so it's uh, our param set. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, he is a param set. Uh, next, please. Mm -hmm. um, Alice generates uh, her ephemeral key pair by, pick, by picking a random number A and calculates a kernel group generator, adding her base point PA and point uh, a uh, times QA. Uh, after that, he calculates isogeny uh, with GA from starting curve, uh, curve E and get isogenous to E curve E mod GA and uh, maps Bob's uh, base points uh, PB and QB from starting curve to this curve. Uh, now she sends her ephemeral public key uh, to Bob. Ephemeral public key, it's a uh, Curve and uh, transmitted uh, base points. Uh, next, please. Upon receiving a public key of Alice, uh, Bob generates his key pair and sends to Alice her public key. As you can see, he is making similar steps as Alice, but he uses another torsion subgroup, uh, free to the power of free torsion subgroup. After that, uh, Bob can calculate shared secret. He calculates isogeny from curve uh, from EA. First, he calculates kernel group generator of this uh, curve using torsion base points from public key uh, with his private key. Uh, next, please. Alice also calculates uh, shared key the same way with her private and Bob's public key. As a result, uh, both uh, both have a uh, shared secret and uh, way calculate is uh, at is a g invariant from curves uh, here e b and uh, here, here uh, b a uh, next please here's a commutative diagram that depicts sidh protocol Our solution, uh, our idea was to build first isogeny based peak uh, by masking public keys of, of SIDH. Uh, next, please. Uh, first attempt uh, to build uh, isogeny peak was like this. Uh, Alice and Bob use the same settings as in SIDH, uh, but additionally, they both calculate two additional points as a function of uh, password and add them to uh, base points, um, that is a part of ephemeral public key. Upon receiving masked, masked public keys of each other, uh, Alice and Bob uh, just subtract uh, masks and get uh, original uh, ephemeral keys, uh, which we use the same way as in SIDH to get shared secret. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, uh, one more. Yes, uh, this uh, scheme is uh, vulnerable to uh, offline dictionary attack. Uh, attacker intercepts a masked public key and goes through the dictionary of passwords, calculating and subtracting them from masked uh, base points. After uh, that, he checks the value of pairing uh, from uh, the obtained points. If a value of pairing is equal to pairing taken from base points, from starting curve uh, to the power of uh, isogeny degree, when attacker can be sure that his candidate on password is correct with a high probability. Uh, next. How to prevent such attack? We have to change algorithm of masking uh, to make uh, masked points be always invariant uh, for pairing. Uh, so the attacker won't be able to distinguish between right uh, password and wrong passwords. This problem can be uh, solved uh, by mapping password to uh, two by two uh, special linear group matrix. Uh, so we first calculate the matrix that depends on password and multiply it with uh, torsion based points. Um, to remove mask, we need to calculate invert mask uh, matrix uh, and multiply it uh, with uh, masked points. Uh,
Let's uh, apply Mobius uh, action uh, to the uh, SIDH. Uh, next, please. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, back, back. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one more back, please. Again, uh, a list generates for SIDH ephemeral key pair, calculates two by two matrix uh, that depends on password and uh, join variant of her uh, of her pair and multiply mat matrix and torsion base points. Upon receiving uh, her masked key, uh, Bob checks a pairing. If uh, it is not equal uh, to constant pairing uh, in the left uh, side of equation, uh, he uh, stops the protocol. Uh, please next. If uh, pairing is okay, when uh, Bob calculates inverse uh, from Alice matrix, he can do it uh, because he knows the password and her curve, and obtains uh, her uh, original public key. Uh, please, next. After that, uh, Bob does the same steps as Alice, generate uh, his key uh, pair, mask, uh, masks uh, it, and uh, sends uh, to Alice. Uh, next. Upon uh, receiving uh, masked public key of Bob, Alice uh, removes mask and calculates shared secret. Uh, the next, please. Yes, it's it's here. Uh, uh, next, please. Sorry. Uh, our uh, scheme uh, has almost the same uh, practical properties uh, as SIDH. Uh, it can use curves from a psyche NIST proposal and uh, with the same lens uh, and has the same lens of messages as in SIDH. Uh, and has uh, little uh, performance overhead if we compare it with uh, SIDH protocol. Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, question, please. Uh, Scott, Scott Flover. Yes. Uh... Quick question: Is this provably as uh, can you does, does, does the security reduce to the SIDH or other, any other hard known hard problem within Psych? Um, we have uh, it's, uh, uh, we have uh, proof, but it's uh, not. Uh, Complete uh, the proof in uh, Biwari, Panchivali, and Rogovai uh, model, uh, but we have uh, some elements that have some doubts. Uh, so still, uh, it's in the process. We're working on the, uh, on the proving. The other thing I wanted to note this is not from above, but not a question, but more generally, this is not the only proposed uh, post quantum peg. So if we are actually interested, we probably want to have yet another competition to select one. Of course, my, my question would be uh, could you detail on the um, one advantage might be the computational complexity? Could you compare it with other? Uh, 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 PAIC, uh, post quantum PAIC proposals, for instance, uh, based on lattices, uh, or could you make a distinction between the different options for post quantum resistant uh, schemes? Uh, it uh, has uh, some uh, proposals uh, based on um, uh, lattice based uh, cryptography. Um, it's about uh, four or three uh, peaks uh, on uh, lattices. Uh, it has um, it has a much more bigger, about uh, may maybe ten, uh, ten uh, times um, 
uh, lens of uh, messages uh, and uh, but we are we uh, we have uh, more good performance uh, I understand you uh, good where is no another uh, Yes, uh, we, uh, there is another uh, protocols uh, based on uh, isogenies, uh, but we, uh, I, I mean, uh, PAKE protocols. Uh, about half uh, of a year uh, ago uh, was work uh, by uh, Japanese cryptographers, uh, but we broke uh, these protocols. We was also on the... Uh, one of uh, them was based on SIDH and another was based on uh, 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 CSI uh, isogeny uh, protocol. Uh, but uh, it was vulnerable to uh, offline dictionary attack uh, in the uh, setting, uh, of, uh, settings uh, of uh, uh, pass uh, passive attacker. So you could uh, just analyze the messages not uh, and not, not to be uh, man in the middle. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, our uh, latest uh, papers. Uh, you can see it uh, on the Yakur uh, ePrint site. Anyone else in, in the queue for questions? We're, we're at the end. I'd, I'd be having one one last question rega regarding the OPRF uh, construction that is, for instance, needed for opaque. Do you have ideas or do you, uh, are you aware of any uh, scheme that might serve um, uh, as a replacement for the Diffie Hellman based OPRF uh, uh, construction for opaque? Could I, could I remind the um, question askers to say their name? Uh, if, if... Uh, sorry, Bjorn Hase. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, our uh, um, uh, construction uh, is uh, more uh, near is the nearest uh, to uh, Hellman. Questions come in. Uh, sorry, uh, I uh, Bjorn asked me one question. Uh, looks like I uh, hasn't, uh, haven't asked it. Uh, last question. Yes, could you, could you repeat it, uh, Bjorn? Sorry. So, and for the, uh, the uh, opaque. Uh, protocol relies on an uh, Olivia's pseudorandom uh, uh, function, OPRF function, which is based on Diffie-Hellman and thus not post-quantum uh, safe, secure. Are you aware of constructions that might uh, post-quantum construction for such an uh, OP Olivia's um, uh, uh, PRF uh, function? This was, was, would be the main obstacle for, uh, for getting opaque for, um, post-quantum secure. Oh, no, I, I don't know uh, such con uh, such constructions. Okay, thank you, Oleg. Uh, uh, our next speaker, Philip Hellenbaker. Since you did not observe my hand, I just wanted to make a statement. This is Ura Blumenthal. I support the work presented by Oleg. I like the approach very much. Hello, can people hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. So uh, the proposal here, um, well, I made a proposal and then Chelsea Colmo and Ian Goldberg separately made a related proposal in signatures. And when we looked at the two together there, 
uh, are taking essentially the same approach. Now, so the point of this presentation is not to go into the details of the proposals. Uh, it is to add uh, work on uh, threshold uh, modes to the existing CFRG elliptic curve algorithms uh, as work items. Uh, I've divided the drafts up into two. The first one, uh, Hallam Baker threshold, that's setting out the math of how all this works and uh, defines how to do threshold modes for um, the ED25519, ED448, and also the X25518. And, uh, yeah. Basically, do everything we're already doing, uh, but be able to split the private keys. Okay, so the question that's come up uh, whenever this has been proposed is, well, we're already doing BLS. Uh, why do that old fuddy-duddy elliptic curve stuff? Isn't pairing going to be better if you want threshold? And the reason that I don't want to do pairing is that while there are some additional cryptographic capabilities you can get out of pairing, as a protocol designer, I'm not interested in those capabilities in the slightest. Sorry. Uh, I can get all the capabilities I need from the existing CFRG curves. The code to do that is widely deployed. And in particular, I can do threshold encryption uh, using uh, the existing X25519 uh, uh, decryptors. And I can create signatures that will be accepted by the existing um, signature checkers. And so, you know, from my point of view, um, adding the threshold modes to the existing crypto is more interesting to me than uh, developing a whole new type of crypto and waiting 10 years for people to get comfortable with that just to do threshold. Okay. So uh, if we go, oh, so that, that was meant to be slide three. Sorry, I was meant to come in. Um, so, I mean, this is the same thing that happened with Diffie-Hellman. I mean, like Diffie-Hellman doesn't actually support encryption. It doesn't support signature. But there are ways that you can use it for both if you uh, package it up right. And I can get around the problems uh, that people see um, in not using pairing. Okay, so next slide. So how does this work? Well, the reason that you can do a threshold stuff in, in elliptic curves is that if you take two private keys, X and Y, well, the corresponding key pairs are going to be X dot B and, X and Y dot B. Okay, so that means that we can, that X plus Y dot B and X plus Y is also going to be a key pair. And this has the really fascinating uh, property that if I know that a particular public key pair has been generated by adding two private keys, I can calculate the public key corresponding to those two private keys just from the knowledge of the public keys alone. And, you know, that's a, that holds for Diffie-Hellman and all the variants thereof. And we can do exactly the same thing with a Diffie-Hellman result. Uh, and what this means is that we can split key, split private keys and join them together and do operations on parts of private keys and join the results together in really interesting ways. And the papers go into showing how that's done. So next slide, please. So the, the basic scheme that I just described that will work for a threshold scheme in which the number of shares is exactly the same as the threshold. You can just use standard edition modulo the um, group order, um, and it just works. You can also make use of Shamir secret sharing, and that allows us to extend the problem so that we can now split a secret key into uh, more shares than the threshold 
and this is just using the same math that we'd use to split a symmetric key using Shamir secret. Uh, the only trick here is that the Shamir secret prime that we use uh, to construct the field is simply the uh, the order of the subgroup. And we then use the Lagrange basis to recombine the uh, shares. So basically what this means is that um, when you do um, a threshold uh, key agreement operation, what you're going to do is uh, you pick your shares and when you recombine them, you need to know which shares were used so that you can create the correct Lagrange basis for them. Um, and you know, there are a few limitations uh, to using the secret sharing scheme as it's described in the draft. And that is what Chelsea and Ian have uh, in their paper that I've not yet ported over. Um, so we can do that uh, and have a, uh, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman special scheme uh, just carries on. OK, so next slide, which is the last slide. So the point here is that I'm asking us to, I'm asking the group to accept this as a, a work item uh, rather than uh, prepare, proposing uh, the details of these doc the documents at this point. But what this gives us is threshold decryption. We can secure documents in the cloud without putting the decryption key in the cloud. So you can have a cloud key server that is doing a Kerberos-style uh, control of the decryption of a collection of documents where the key server has control but cannot decrypt. And that gets you around the problem of uh, what happens if the system administrator happens to be um, a traitor and uh, uploading your uh, documents to um, uh, the Washington Post or whatever. Uh, another application of this approach is, um, if you're familiar with Kosha sideband resistance, it's a really useful technique that we should now be using uh, for doing uh, any elliptic curve cryptography. It was patented, but my understanding of the uh, patent dates is, unless I've missed something, uh, I'm hoping that uh, the original Kosher patents have now uh, expired. So what you do is that instead, uh, so as Kosher's a sideband, side channel attacks, the way that he's, they work is you're doing the same private op key operation again and again and again, and you monitor and look for statistical similarities from one round to another. And so you need to be able to do RSA thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Now, what you can do is you can split the exponent. So instead of doing the an operation once, you can split it into two, split the private key each time you use it and do two separate uh, encryptions uh, and then combine the result. And that means that you're not doing that repeated operation uh, that gives a side, band, side channel uh, attack purpose. You can use it for side code signing. Uh, I think that threshold signatures, the killer app there, in my view, would be code signing. And in particular, as a, when I was uh, involved in the CA industry, one of the big problems that kept coming up would be how can open source projects sign their code and get a code signing certificate? And there are really non-trivial problems about how those groups that don't have an organized central organizing point and don't want a central organizing point can come together. And so that's uh, something that happens there. And then finally, you can do redundant notary service, services. Uh, if you want to do blockchain type things and you're signing your notary output of your one-way sequence at multiple services, well, you, pr you probably want to have three services so you've got fault tolerance. And then you've got the question of, well, how do we combine the results 
and you end up with an interesting race condition there where you can end up with two different signings of the same output uh, by different combinations. It's not satisfactory. You can use the Thresh, the Shamir secret sharing approach uh, to map your fault tolerance criteria directly onto the crypto. And uh, there's more information at my uh, private site showing how I use these techniques to uh, construct a user-centric PKI, and that's the mathematical mechanism. So this isn't proposing the whole of the mathematical mesh. This is just proposing the crypto that makes the mesh work. Thank you. Are there any questions? The first person in the queue is Chelsea Conlow. Hi, this is Chelsea. Uh, so one thing I just wanted to quickly mention is that um, for our Ian and I's work on Frost, uh, it's currently in draft status. And we are making a couple tweaks right now just for um, some additional security properties. So I guess I just wanted to say uh, there are some differences between this work and Frost, and that's something that we are going to be fleshing out uh, in the future. I guess one question I had that is also a little bit to the chairs is about um, if this is adopted as a work item, what are some of the use cases, I guess, like beyond just uh, the mathematical mesh that would like to be targeted? So like, for example, in this proposal, there's a pretty uh, narrow focus on, as I understand, um, on key distribution and having some trust around how keys are distributed. Whereas in the literature, um, and like, for example, in our work, uh, there's a notion of using um, uh, sort of an untrusted model so that all participants are equally trusted. So I guess um, my question is broader about like, if this is adopted as a work item, what are some of the other use cases we'd like to target? Well, I, I'm open to as, as many use cases as people want to propose. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think it's productive if I invent other people's use cases. <laughs> Any more questions? I'd also point out that we were planning to do a lot more work together and then I was uh, unable to do any work. Blown, of course, before COVID. Okay, last call for the queue. Do you have any concern regarding uh, quantum resistance or lack thereof? is going to be precisely as quantum resistant as uh, the uh, existing elliptic curve systems. Uh, if elliptic curve, I, I mean, you can prove uh, that the uh, Shamir secret sharing and the threshold splitting up, that part of it is uh, inf information theoretic secure. Um, the only assumption here is that the base elliptic curve stuff works. Now, we've already got to the point where the whole of international commerce depends upon those elliptic curves and or RSA being secure. So we're not increasing our exposure at all here. Uh, and I don't see at this point um, any of the post-quantum stuff uh, that is being proposed being um, I, I don't think that that is firm enough for us to want to then look at the threshold for variations thereof. Um, so, I mean, like, it might be an interesting question to ask the people proposing post-quantum, is your stuff threshold uh, capable? But at, at this point, um, I, I'm a lot less worried about quantum computing than a lot of you. I, I did particle physics. And, you know, scalable quantum computing, no, it's not.
not been demonstrated yet, not until you've got an iron machine. Right, thank you, Philip. Um, Chairs, we'll discuss and we might do a follow up with you and uh, see who else is interested. Thank you. Um, one more reminder to sign your name in the virtual do sheets. Now we have uh, 69 participants in the robots and only 59 in virtual do sheets. So please sign your name if you haven't done this. Done this. So now, Scott Fuller, additional stateful hash based signature parameters. Please, Scott. Okay, yes. So let's make, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, next, uh, yeah, next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, uh, basically, we're going to look at uh, hash based, uh, stateful hash based signatures, which are signature schemes based on a hash function, which we require state. They are relatively efficient. Uh, signature sizes aren't too large, but they have the drawback of requiring state. Uh, uh, one of the things we'd like to do is propose uh, uh, new parameter sets to the LMS stateful hash based signatures, which has already been approved by CFRG. Um, just that we have to, I have to go through this particular CFR, it has to be reviewed by CFRG, and I'm here to ask for such a review. Uh, next slide. Um, the first set of parameters is based on what we call SHA-256-192, which is just SHA-256 truncated to 192 bits. Um, uh, this, re this effectively reduces the uh, in, in terms of NIST PQ levels from level 5 to level 3. It also reduces the signature size by about 40%. Um, attacks, uh, because the best attack is a second uh, pre-image attack, uh, 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 attack by conventional computers is still completely unfeasible due to 192 work. And if we count for limits on circuit depth, uh, which we, we assume that some, uh, the attacker has to get a forge, find a forgery within, say, 100 years, um, the quantum, uh, attack by Grover's algorithm using quantum computer could still take circa 2128, perhaps a little bit less, based on, uh, on the speed of a quantum computer. Uh, Shot 26 evaluation still is, is uh, completely implausible. So we believe that this, this particular parameter set is still is perfectly secure for everybody. It's just, uh, just significantly smaller. Uh, next slide. Uh, the second set of parameters is based on SHA-3. We're using the Shake 256 uh, extended uh, alpha, uh, extensible uh, uh, hash function, uh, generating either 192 or 256 bits. This is mostly an alternative to SHA-256, and the signature size and the cryptographical strength is identical to SHA-256. Um, and again, I'm here to ask for a review. Uh, any questions? It doesn't sound like we have any questions, so uh, thank you for your time, I think. <laughs> Many thanks, Scott. And so the last talk is uh, John Meston, uh, deterministic ECDSA and EDDSA uh, signature with noise. Uh, so uh, do you hear me? So talk is about deterministic ECDSA and EDDSA signatures with additional randomness. And the draft, uh, draft Matson is now in version two. And next slide, please. So some background. Uh, so all ECC signatures require a per message number. This has traditionally been generated uh, purely ra random, uh, but biases in the random number generation read, lead to catastrophic consequences, such as key compromise. 
Uh, therefore, the current best practice is to use deterministic ECC signatures such as deterministic ECDSA or EDDSA. EDDSA is only standardized in a deterministic way. Uh, and there's a lot of RFCs recommending this. There's also a whole bunch of drafts doing the same. However, since EDDSA has been published, there has been quite a lot of academic study on the security of deterministic ECC signatures. And the results is that uh, deterministic ECC signature has theoretical weaknesses against side channel and fault injection attacks. And <clears throat> it seems like these attacks can be practically feasible in some environments, especially in IoT deployments. And to the right here, you can see uh, real world IoT deployments. And as you can imagine, it's quite easy here to master side channels or even inject faults. And um, uh, there's been concern from governments uh, German BSI has co-authored several of these academic papers and NIST raised uh, <clears throat> concerns. They are currently planning to standardize, uh, standardize deterministic ECDSA and EDDSA. Uh, next slide. So what can be done? Uh, one countermeasure to these types of attacks recommended in basically all of these papers and also implemented in several popular uh, crypto libraries is to reintroduce some additional randomness to the otherwise deterministic generation of the per message secret number and this is also called as called hedged signatures in some of the papers uh, this is quite simple and well understood it works uh, both for ECDSA and EDDSA with very sim similar solutions. Uh, only require minor modifications to speed, none at all to verification. It does not increase the number of point modifications, which is makes it light and suitable for IoT deployments, which is in most need this type of uh, mitigation. And uh, you get good, you get the hedged security. So even if the randomness is weak, the security falls back to what you would have if you did purely deterministic signature signatures. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there's quite many, there's already many deployments using uh, ECC signatures, and there will be many more in the future. I think, don't know how many use deterministic signatures, but I, currently I think newly deployed are, for example, TLS 103 and COSI recommends deterministic signatures. Uh, we think this, Re attacks from academic research is quite looks quite serious and we think that ITF or IRTF should quite quickly update the recommendations for deployments where these attacks are concerned. Uh, <clears throat> and what we suggest in the draft is updates to the deterministic ECDSA and the EDDSA RFCs to say that in deployments where these type of attacks are concerned, the following steps are recommended instead. And the updates in technical update is to add a random number set, shown here in, in green, as well as uh, a byte string of zeros, shown in blue. And the meaning with the zeros is to make sure that the key and the message are in different hash invocations, mitigating attacks where the attacker can uh, control or choose the message. Uh, 
updates in version one is that we have changed the concaten to concatenation with fed instead of sore. Yes, uh, well, uh, that's a much better and conservative solution aligning with academic papers. Uh, no optimizations are needed here. Then uh, there was several people suggesting that said should be concatenated uh, before secret key to align with universal hashing. And <clears throat> the third uh, change is that we did add this uh, zero padding, which is recommended in one of the, at least one of the academic papers. Um, so is CFRG the right, if you agree that this is, should be done first, uh, is CFRG the right place? I would think so. CFRG has the right competence and is also, has also published EDDSA. So if you agree with that, uh, I would like CFRG to adopt and publish uh, as a mitigation and updated recommendation for this. Um, I think it's quite straightforward. Um, construction, I think, can uh, move the parameters a little bit in, in the order, and maybe so the parent sol solution is to choose said to the same size of the key. You could probably do it a little bit shorter, like 32 bytes for all, probably be enough. Any questions? Uh, this is Phil. Um, I, I'll just point out that the uh, work that I proposed uh, are with the uh, threshold signatures, uh, that also has the same effect on the signatures in that you're going to get uh, different potential signatures uh, depending upon uh, which combination of signatures you have when you sign them. Uh, and so you end up uh, wanting to randomize the various security properties. So if, if both go ahead, we're going to need to coordinate and fix the configuration. Uh, it's hard to hear. I think that solution, I, I, I support that solution. I don't think that's a very good solution for IoT as it adds more point multiplications, also it will take some time before that's standardized, and I think this is needed now. Jan Hase, I have one question regarding the zero padding for the randomness. Are you aware of any paper which has analyzed this in detail? I've had some discussion with Leila Batena on this topic, and she recommended specifically to add such a zero padding also for applications such as CPACHE, but she was not aware of any uh, uh, quantitative measure measurement on how to find out what, uh, how much this mitigation is helping. Are you aware of some work on that? Uh, yeah, this is uh, recommended in one of the papers that we cite. I think I, I can some check which is, it's uh, one of the late, I think Daman is co-author of that. They say that without this, some of their attacks are still uh, possible. Um, but separating the key and the message in different hash invocations mitigates all of their attacks. Next, we hear Scott Fleur. Okay. Yes. Um, at least RFC 6979 is structured, it's deliberately structured so that. Uh, it basically does the 800 dash, uh, implements the H HMAC DRBG as proof as, as documented by NIST to actually generate uh, the actual uh, 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 secret value. Um, would it make sense to maintain that structure and have your ha hedge input as an, as, a, as an input to the HMAC DRBG as, as allowed within the 800-90A? I, I don't have any answer to that question. I, I, that is 
probably possible and i i would be open to any any solution as long as it's mitigate the attacks yeah i haven't looked at this one this is just the first time i'm looking at it either so i don't know off the top of my head any more questions concerns comments so my feedback to, to Scott's remark. Uh, so the feed has asked this question regarding the zero padding and, and the structure to several side channel persons. And they told me that one should try to avoid to enter the secret uh, entry in it, uh, several times into the hash operation. And to my best knowledge, uh, if you are iterating HMAC constructions, uh, um uh, you are in the risk to enter to enter the secret several times that might be uh might even worsen uh, the situation from a side channel perspective so, and, so okay. that's what i what i what i got uh, understood from from the discussions i'm not a true side channel expert but that's uh, the feedback that i got and also um, the, the hash operations might be quite costly on a side channel protected hardware so that's the, the hardware guys that were working on, on side channel uh, where implementations recommended to avoid uh, <laughs> the hash functions because it's very difficult to um, implement them in a side channel protected way. Expensive compared to the, uh, the, the point multiplications involved? Okay. Hello, uh, this is Rene. Um, I don't know if it's my turn in the queue, but uh, um, I have a general comment. Like, why does CFG uh, want to even uh, provide the details of the, the ephemeral private key calculation? Because you could just uh, generate it uh, randomly, and then there could be an uh, informative annex that says you could do it like this. Because uh, I think CFG has absolutely almost zero expertise in side channel uh, resistance. Some do and some don't. Uh, Stanislas Michlev with my chair's head off. Uh, personally, I support this work and I think that in CFG we have some people who have expertise in the field of side channel resistance at least with uh, algorithmic uh, countermeasures. So personally, again, with my chair's head off, I support this work and I think that CFRG is the right place to do this. And uh, with my chair's head on, I would like to say that, of course, we will take this to the list. And uh, personally, I, will, I would like to support this work. I think this is important and uh, really good for CFRG. <laughs> Can I ask this Rene again? Can I ask one question, John? Um, are yes. you suggest are you suggesting that uh, once it is a is kind of randomized, that uh, implementations will uh, use uh, a fresh code per point to uh, indicate a departure from this uh, deterministic approach? I don't. Why would you need a Code point. These are all the verifier doesn't really need to know if the um, signature were randomized or deterministic or deterministic with randomness. Maybe the verifier don't, doesn't. But uh, if you uh, if you look at, so the last few days, I've looked at the the the, the Cosi and the Hosi uh, code point uh, uh, assignments and all the details involved in specifying it, which also includes the signing operation and a clear reference and it seems to me that uh, even suggesting that uh, deployments uh, there may be deployments where this is safe to use, be used in a deterministic fashion it seems to be kind of like uh, unworldly right basically it's a flawed al algorithm unless it's being fixed like you suggested yeah but i think cozy i don't know tls already changed from randomized to deterministic with the same code point. If I remember what Cozy says, it says 
you recommend to use a deterministic algorithm, for example, like specified in 6979. So, it already opens up for you to do something else. But Gosi uh, uh, doesn't. Also, TLS 1.3 doesn't. So, that means that the uh, application can basically can ignore uh, whatever is provided. Seemingly refer to 8032, which probably should never have re reached the finish line in this stage. Uh, I think there should be a, a, a point where uh, a new spec that actually fixes this whole de risk business uh, is clearly indicated as such. Because I, I think it will, it's kind of a black eye on the CFG uh, working group. So we'll take this to the list and uh, see what people will say. Uh, no more comments, concerns, questions? Uh, hello, Watson from Cloudflare. Yeah, I, I think we should not change code point. Uh, changing code point is an excellent way to introduce all sorts of interoperability problems. It actually makes it harder to adapt a change because all of a sudden devices that need to interoperate with the already installed base need to implement both. And even though you don't have a interoperability problem generating the, the generating the um, nonce, uh, or not the nonce, the random value in ECDSA actually randomly versus deterministically, you would still have to implement the deterministic version if you were to adopt a different code point. You want to fix the problem of side channel attacks, you would push a document saying side, you, should, you know, if you're vulnerable to side channel attacks, you should use a randomized thing. Of course, that isn't a panacea, it depends on the magnitude of the signal. And you actually need to look at the implementation, right? The, the, the side channel defenses are very easily broken by one particular part of the code or another part of the code. So it's never going to be something where just you can just look at what's on the wire and tell you actually need to do some work. Uh, Rene, one more, one more comment though. Um, so I've heard in the past with IETF many, many times that uh, there was a need for algorithm agility, but ever when, when uh, a push comes to the shaft, always uh, the current deployments are being mentioned. I think that does, uh, that kind of undoes the whole algorithm agility uh, disservice. I think we should write a die, die, die document on uh, the deterministic EDDSA scheme and replace it by something that takes us the errors in there. Well, whatever. So there are lots of applications where you do not have the sort of vulnerability to side channel analysis that you do with IoT devices. I'm not sure. <clears throat> So many thanks for the opinions. We'll take it to the list. And uh, I think thank you to John. Thank you. Now, any other business? Do we have anything other any other things to discuss? Um, Rene once more. I, I have a question on the errata process in uh, the CFRG documents. Um, I noticed that there are quite a few errors in the RFC 7748 document, and some of those errata had apparently been addressed, and I couldn't find any discussion on that. So how do we uh, fix fix incorrect address addressing of errata to RFC documents in the CFRG group? 
sorry, did you say that some changes were done incorrectly? You want to re re reverse them and change something, yes? Yes, and I also didn't find any uh, process that was applied and, uh, and mailing list discussion. Uh, what, what happens is a writer reports uh, email to um, IR, IRSG chair and CFRG chairs. And if we know the answer, we typically deal with it. Uh, but obviously, we can make mistakes. And so, um, Just email chairs. Sure, and, and I also found when I looked at this particular RFC, this, so this is the CFVG curve document, right? Mm -hmm. um, in in lots of ITF document, there's a round where there's a working group last call, and then there's some uh, uh, subsequent discussion with the IHG, I, IESG involved and uh, and a bunch of uh, AD security directors and so on. I couldn't find any information on uh, what process was followed, uh, uh, was followed after uh, the kind of the working group uh, last call equivalent in the CRG with that document. So, is there any process like that? Yes, <laughs> yes, there is IRTF process. It basically goes to IRSG, which is composed of chairs of other research groups, uh, IRTF chair and some at large members. There is at least one review uh, going there, and then uh, initial review, and then there is a follow up, and then ISG goes. Uh, it does review for conflicts. I can point you to the document if you want. Thanks. Uh, send me email. I'll I'll point you to the document. If people are interested in general, I can post it to the mailing list. It's a well established process. Yeah, uh, I think I'm in the queue. Um, so one of the things that I've, I referenced in the uh, threshold document is another spec I wrote, UDF, which I hadn't thought of bringing. Philip, you are very faint at the moment. I don't know if it's just me, but. Can you hear me now? That's better, yes. Okay. So one of the, the uh, things that I developed a while ago was called Uniform Date, Data Fingerprint. And, you know, that wasn't something I would have thought of bringing to CFRG as it was, because it's basically just um, message digest fingerprints in base 32 with an algorithm identifier in front of. However, uh, as I've been circulating that, I've had requests to add some features. And so it's grown to the point where arguably it is within the ambit of what CFRG might claim. And, one of those features is um, Shamir secret sharing. So the idea is that say I've got um, a secret key that I've encrypted my hard drive under, I might want to Shamir secret share that and have you know two out of three shares. Okay, so that you know that's a fairly simple thing to implement. But the next one is another thing that I was asked for was deterministic key generation from a um, from a fingerprint string. And so what you might use that for is uh, I want to configure my uh, SSH uh, on all my clients with the same uh, client key. And instead of emailing myself the, um, the file, I would enter it into the console. And so, and then you might also use the Shamir secret sharing on that. So the question is whether I should uh, propose that here. Sorry, my brain is a bit fried at the moment. Send send uh, an email to chairs if you have. Uh, Draft already, send a pointer. Yeah. We'll, we'll follow up. Okay. So we're one minute over, but there's um, one last person in the queue, which is Colin Perkins. And you have uh, the privilege to uh, close this out, Colin. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure I'm worthy of uh, cl closing this out. Uh, I just wanted to follow up briefly to the, um, the, the, the 
the, the comment before um, Phil's there, just just to say that I'm, I'm aware that there are a bunch of errata that uh, still need to be verified. Um, so uh, yeah, that, 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 that those have definitely not been forgotten, although uh, I haven't got around to, to checking those and checking with the uh, CFRG chairs to to go through the process. Um, so 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 do do look out for those um, being verified uh, in in the hopefully coming weeks. Stop in the record now. There, those beepings uh, indicate that people are logging off. So thank you again for um, what.